Hello everybody, welcome to another exciting 1 a.m. Saturday morning workbench extravaganza. Today I thought I would talk a little about one of my pride and joy projects, um, the beta movie camcorder. Um, I've been into these things since I was in high school. I'm 35 now and I think I got my, what year is it? 2023, I guess. Never seems like it in my house, but 2023, <laughs> I think I bought my first one in 2002. It was my first beta anything. I could record tapes before I could play them. <laughs> um, but anyway, as I've worked on them through the years, I've kind of gotten some tips and tricks. I thought I'd share them. Um, I'm no major guru, but uh, I don't see a great number of videos going into too much depth. So I thought I'd share my knowledge. Um, so <clears throat> this machine here, this is a BMC 660. This is a CCD model. Um, not to be confused with the older models like the 220, which I have here, plenty of parts units. This one has a dead, uh, this one has a dead tube, which a lot of them seem to. Um, and a good way to tell if you're going to have problems is if you apply power to it and you put a tape in and turn it on, if the caution light lights and stays lit, it's a good sign that unfortunately it, it can't see something. Something's not right. And you'll also, you may see in the viewfinder that the low light indicator lights, and no matter what you do, and no matter how bright of a light you point the lens at, it won't go out. So that's a good sign that the uh, system can't see any light and that the tube might be might be a goner. I don't know if they went to air or, or what happened, but it was apparently from the little I can find, the, uh, they were they were failing way back in the day. And keep in mind, these cameras came out in like 1983, and by what, 84, 85, you had VHSC and high air video eight and all kinds of playback options that replaced it. So spare parts for these cameras are unheard of. I've, I've never been able to find anything. Um, and I've been at this for a little while. Um, so these here, I actually recently just got these, um, <clears throat> and they were pretty well completely dead. Um, I think I got five cameras, five GCS1 commercials, and they have an electronic viewfinder, which is kind of neat. And all but, uh, I have four viewfinders, and one of them worked. The capacitors had all leaked, and they needed board repairs, and I had to ultrasonically clean the boards to get rid of all the residual gunk. And so now all the viewfinders work. And the other thing I had to do, which is getting very common with these, is the um, the imager became foggy. And I'll get into that in a second. Um, so anyway, so I've rebuilt the imagers on these. So these are crystal clear again. And I've done those, and I've done two other 550s. Because I did the first one, I think, in 2019, because it was for our wedding. So I used that camera to record that and uh actually had two going but that's another story anyway so the imager um i'm going to talk about the imager and how to fix that and i'm going to show as much of that process as i can because this camera needs it done um and i'm also going to talk about the autofocus belts and the zoom belts and how to replace those and w with what um, i don't know if i have the sizes offhand but i can at least tell you where to get a belt that'll work um and I guess whatever else kind of turns up. Um, if you can't buy a battery pack, I figure I'll mention this. This is actually from high school. Um, not the battery so much, but I actually, you can get one of these 9.6 volt RC car batteries <laughs> and some Velcro. And I made this little adapter from Radio Shack parts. And actually that would, I had Velcro on the back of the beta movie and I would stick the battery on there and plug that into the DC jack. And that's how I used to record before I, now I'm rebuilding the battery packs, but back then I didn't have the skill yet. But uh, anyway, so I wanted to mention something about belts and I'll give you the sizes for the 660 while we're here. And uh, yeah, so I guess we'll get into it. Um, so this camera here is, like I said, it's a 660 CCD model, super beta. And the complaint was, that when you put a tape in, um, it would thread, but the drum wouldn't rotate. So normally when you put a tape in, the machine threads it, and then it pre-rolls the tape for a few seconds, and the drum will 
uh, of course, rotate, because I believe it records for a second or two. And uh, there was no drum rotation. So we were hoping it would be something dumb like a belt, but I honestly haven't seen the belt break on these. They just kind of get loose and get indented. So I got it here and I noticed that the five volts to the drum servo were absent. And you might get like 0.3 volts when the camera tried to run the drum, but that wasn't right. So using a manual for a 550, which is all I have on hand, I was able to uh, basically shotgun, which I'm not a fan of, but I shotgun recapped all of the capacitors, all of the uh, bypass electrolytic capacitors on that five volt line. And I happened to find one that was literally just leaking out the bottom everywhere. So <laughs> I replaced that one and the rest for good measure. And that fixed the drum rotation issue. So at that point, I had a good recorded image. Autofocus wasn't working because the belt's bad. And I really didn't see any fogginess to this imager, but let me take it out of here. And getting to this, <laughs> I wish I had the time and patience and the good language uh, to video taking all of this apart. But you're going to have to experience that for yourself because <laughs> it is a lot of fun. That's a rite of passage. But anyway, so we take this out carefully. And this is your, this is your imaging board. Let's see if I can zoom in on this or at least get it to reflect a little bit. Let's see. This app that I'm using doesn't really <laughs> like to focus that well. But yeah, right there, a little bit on the right side of it. See how it's got that haze in there? Like right, right in there. So what's happening there is this is the infrared filter. And what happens with these <clears throat> is the, the adhesive, the optical cement that holds the few layers of this together, I guess it's starting to fail. And I believe it's moisture related because they seem to get worse when they go into temperature changes and like the lens fogs up. That's when this seems to either start or go pretty rampant uh, when that happens. So anyway, so that starts to creep in. You get these black spots in the recorded image. This is only on this one side so far. So my test recordings don't really show a whole lot of fog. But then again, I, I've only been indoors because it's been either dark or raining whenever I've done those tests. So anyway, this can be fixed. Um, as I've said, I've fixed a couple. And my method for doing this is as follows. Um, let's see if I have a, whoa, let's see if I have a screwdriver here. So basically take this apart. There's two small screws here that these screws will disappear any second now. But there's two screws that hold this top plate in. Hope I'm focused. Kind of. Maybe. Sort of. So anyway, so the plate comes out. And of course with it comes the actual IR filter block. So then immediately cover that sensor up. I always take the shield, the shield that comes off, and I just put it right over that so no dust gets into it. And then if you look, and my fingerprints go away, <clears throat> you've got like a multi-section little piece here. And on one side, there are these little indications for how things go. So I'm gonna really take a few pictures of this to make sure I have it right. And you can see right here where it's white, there's like a weird crust. And I think that's where our where our issue is, or where it might be starting on that side. Not really sure. I don't know if the paint here breaks and lets the moisture in or what, but it is from like 1986. So are we surprised? <laughs> so anyway, if we could see it. And you can kind of see it at the top. But anyway, what I'll do is I will take this little this little element here and I have a, a glass dish in the garage and I'll take some acetone that I get from the hardware store and I will dunk this in the acetone and I will let it sit overnight and what will happen is it'll slowly creep in the sides where the air is getting in and it'll naturally kind of separate these pieces and all this black paint on the outside will scrape away and that's okay um, what I do later is I'll replace that with either some some really malleable electrical tape like uh, I've used um, 
like Scotch 88 or 33, something like that. Or I guess you could use heat shrink, but you have to trim it very carefully around the outside and not get fingerprints all over it. And then you can put it back in and it'll work. But uh, <clears throat> when I talk, I lose my breath. Oh my God. Um, anyway, I'm just so excited um, to re-adhere it because the acetone will get rid of, um, it, it'll allow it to separate. But then comes the disgusting, awful process of actually taking that acetone and trying to take a hundred Q-tips and clean off all that old, all that old adhesive. And what I've actually found works really well, if it's still here, ooh, is a Q-tip and some Novus Number Two. You can actually kind of polish that adhesive off, and then once you get the adhesive off, <clears throat> I'll very carefully take a excuse me, um, some like 99% isopropyl, and then I'll clean off all that polish residue so that it's nice and clean, blow it off with some compressed air to get rid of any dust. And I don't actually have the real bottle of it. I don't even know where it is right now. But what I use is, I believe it's called Norland 61, number 61, uh, UV curing optical cement. And then I'll reline all these pieces up the way that they were. And then to keep them in line, because as soon as you sit them on one another and put cement on, those pieces will just slide off of one another really easily. So I made this little jig here. <laughs> it's just a piece of uh, like L-shaped aluminum stock, JB welded to a board. And what I'll do is I'll put something under this side of it so it kind of sits at an angle. And then that will allow me to very carefully hold my lens piece here. And then I can put the pieces on. And I don't normally do that flat. And then once all the pieces are there and the air bubbles are out, and don't do that next to a window, because <laughs> um, it'll cure. Um, I kind of give it a few taps, get it centered down there, and then I very carefully walk outside. And within, I don't even know how long it takes because I'm afraid to touch it, but probably after like maybe a half hour maximum or something, that is solid as a rock and it's never coming apart again. Um, <coughs> whew. Uh, anyway, so that's what I'll do. I'll try and document as much as I can. Um, it's an interesting process. I mean, it's it's really splitting hairs with these, but like I said, I've always loved these cameras, and it's a shame to see them get tossed for a foggy... Well, it's a shame to see them get tossed just because they're old, but it's another shame to see people who really want one keep buying them and having this problem. So it's, it's quite involved, but you can fix it. Um, so then I'm going to put... You can see my, my uh, back rear element there is exposed. I'm just going to put that shield in the way so it doesn't get dust in it. And, um, let's see, where's our board? Not to, not to move this around too much because I don't want to get dust into it. But another thing to do, and this again was in fantastic condition. Um, normally there is some trace damage on these, but this is your CD4 imager board, which sits, your lens is here, and this sits right behind the lens as, as I guess you could imagine. And um, these capacitors were originally electrolytic, and they leak. And <clears throat> I think Mater, Mr. Betamax talks about this on his site. He replaces these. I believe he uses tantalum. These are aluminum organic polymer capacitors. But I replace them, clean everything up really nice, and make sure they fit because you don't want them to <laughs> you don't want them to sit crooked in there, else your focus will be all messed up. But uh, I replace all those too. And then if you're in there anyway, this is. I don't even think, you might want to take pictures of this if you work on it. I believe this is the DC to DC converter. And even in the manual, they give you no schematic for this. It's just kind of an outline part. And it is filled with the electrolytic capacitors, including these Sanyo. I think they might be like an epoxy, like an aluminum solid capacitor. They were, the light blue ones are a known issue in like the 5000 series betas. I think I have a video on that. But anyway, this one still needs a few more caps ordered. You can see I made use of some larger ones that I fit in there creatively. But that mounts, actually, that mounts right behind the CCD or CD4 board in the shielding back here. So if you've got the lens out, now is the time to tackle that. Because if this starts wigging out, you're going to have all sorts of problems. And this camera is not fun to trace problems out on. Whew. So where was I? Let's talk about belts. We'll start with the main belts. And let me get another camera I have in pieces.
<clears throat> so the drive system is actually pretty cool on this. It's it's relatively simple, but it unfortunately opens up the door to a fun problem if you encounter it. So this here is your drum motor. And the drum motor, of course, runs the drum. So here's the bottom of your video head drum. And then it kind of comes over here to this relay pulley. And there's a brass pulley here with a set screw. And I'll get to that in a second. And then that drives your capstan flywheel here. So, <laughs> as I found out, and as I figured would happen, according to what I read in the manual, when I brought, when I bought third-party belts uh, for this client's camera here, the I bought the belts from Projector Recorder, uh, Projector Recorder Belt or Russell Industries. And this is not a knock on them because I'm thankful they're still around and I buy tons of stuff from them. Um, but the belts, and I was told this, and I think it was Mr. Betamax that told me this, and I get it because Sony was very particular. The Sony belts are sized very, very specifically um, with the right durometer of rubber and the right thickness. And what happens is when you replace it, so this is the problem I had, I replaced the capstan belt with this um, replacement. And the capstan belt had an indent, but the camera still recorded fine. I recorded a while with it, beautiful picture, no tracking noise, nothing, everything was great. I wanted to leave the original belts, kind of, but since it's not my camera, I figured, you know, <laughs> I should probably replace it with new belts. And I had never tried third-party belts because I really don't find too many belt issues with these beta movies. But I thought, what the heck? So I ordered them. Two of PRB, PRB's belts are in here, um, but this is the one for the capstan, and it's about, I don't know what it would be, it's a 0.035 inch um, thickness belt, and the Sony was a 0.02 inch, or it's probably millimeters because it's from Japan, but um, it was obviously thinner, and what happens is, <clears throat> let me catch my breath here, oh my gosh, all that excitement, um, what happens <laughs> is that the, uh, since everything's run off one motor, there's no capstan servo in this camera. And this is all explained in the service manual. So when the belt isn't quite right, the capstan doesn't quite run at the right speed, and it creates a, a tracking error, which will manifest itself on playback as kind of like a, kind of like a scrolling, keep doing that, you can see that there, like a scrolling bar of snow and you can't really track it out. You can get it to slow down or speed up. It looks just like a, a misadjusted capstan servo on a VCR. And uh, the only way, <laughs> let me get this camera again. There's a way to fix that. And you think, ah, it's probably just an electrical adjustment. No, it's actually <laughs> this, this brass pulley here, which again, don't know if I'm focused or not. They actually made different versions of this little relay pulley that are different diameters, like like the smallest amounts of, of difference. And you were supposed to put a test tape in and run the tape in playback mode. Now don't get too excited about that. <laughs> it's rudimentary, it's very basic. Um, to actually get the three kilohertz tone out of the test tape, and then the test tape, or, or that frequent, you'd put up a frequency counter, you'd adjust by the deviation on the test tape, um, you know, for the fun of it, I think I have one of those too. There we are. So here's a test tape. Sony uh, KR51V, one of the few I've got. And uh, so you'd actually adjust. It's a 3 kilohertz, a 300 hertz. You would adjust by that amount, because that's the amount that this tape is made off of exactly 3,000 hertz. And then there's a table and you calculate the difference based on what your frequency counter says, and you can buy another relay pulley that changes the speed. <laughs> so all that being said, you want to use the closest belt you can find. <clears throat> and the belt that PRB sent was an FRY 6.7. And I thought it was a tad bit tight and I thought it was too thick. And when I put it in, it developed immediately that capstan servo you know, drift with that, with that rolling bar of snow. 
And so what I did is I put the original capstan belt back in and I left these two in. You can read that. Those are the part numbers. This one is for, these are for the uh, drum and the relay pulley. So those are the flat belts for that. And then this is the one that didn't work so well for the capstan, uh, the flat belt. And so what I ordered was an FRX. No, sorry. I ordered an FRW uh, 7.0. So I just ordered two of those, and I haven't gotten it yet, but it's a thinner belt, um, and it's a little bit bigger. So hopefully that works. But keep that in mind, because if you think, oh no, it's an electronics issue, it might not be. Try the original belts if they still worked, and see if it clears up. So, added to that, the other belts you will need that I happen to note, um, the forward belt, which is the take-up reel belt, um, should be an SCQ 6.0, and that's on the tape door side. And then the threading belt is an SCX uh, 2.6. So that's your threading belt you need to order. If it that that'll also affect if the uh, if you hit eject and it doesn't unthread or you it won't pop the door. You'll hear it kind of run. You'll hear a whirring in there, and nothing happens. Uh, that's all controlled by that SCX 2.6. Uh, threading belt. <clears throat> All right, and the, I guess one of the last things I wanted to talk about was the autofocus and zoom belt, which is located up here in this front assembly. I wish I had a lens assembly apart. One second. Nope, it's buried. <laughs> anyway, um, so the problem is there is no belt listing. There, there's a, I wish I could show it, but um, I don't have a spare lens. I have a lens assembly sitting around somewhere that was just connectors and a big mess, and I don't know where it's at. Um, <clears throat> well, just to give an idea of where I'm talking about. So this is a this is a 660. Um, also, never leave your batteries in there because now that's gone. It doesn't even have a contact anymore. Um, so up in this area, and I'm trying to think which side it's even on. I think from memory, the zoom belt, if you take this battery door, this battery compartment out, the zoom motor's up here and there's a plastic cover around it to get to the pulley. And generally the belt for the zoom kind of works. Um, the autofocus belt is typically just a gunky, disgusting goo. So you'll have to clean that out. You have to get there first, which is fun. And then you clean it out. And what I use is a bunch of Q-tips and some good old fashioned ammonia. And uh, that'll dissolve the, uh, the gunk. Um, but then the question is, what the heck do you use to replace the belt? Because they don't sell a belt that small. Um, there's no belt listing. There's no part number for it. Even if there was, it'd also be goo in the bag. So what do you do? Um, I've tried. <laughs> I started messing with that in like 2015 and on my 220s. And I used, oh my gosh, I used dental bands and, you know, O-rings from the hardware store and whatever else. Some of it worked, but the thing is, it didn't work very long. And the motor can't take a lot of stress. So what I found that works and it's still working and I'll have to, if I figure out the sizes for each motor, cause I cannot remember, it's been a while since I've done one of these and I will do it to this camera. So I will edit the description with the proper part number. Um, so what these are, <laughs> are they are watch back gaskets for wristwatches and they are super thin, super flexible, very pliable, uh, very small O-rings that seal the back cover of a wristwatch where the battery goes. And I got these from Esslinger and Co. E-S-S-L-I-G-E-R and Company of St. Paul, Minnesota. And they come in all different sizes. And these are probably some of the bigger ones. That might be one of the ones I used 
because there's only one left in there. Um, but they are super small, very pliable, and they work really well for the zoom motor and the autofocus motor. So there's my idea. I don't think anyone's ever talked about replacing those before, but these things seem to work. So anyway, um, what else? What other tidbits can I offer with these cameras? Uh, this is a great tool uh, for VCRs or whatever else. Take yourself an old beta cassette, take the flap off, and uh, this one's just gutted. So I can just kind of run the machine through its motions without mangling a tape in it. Um, this unit here is kind of neat, even though I can only use it partially because I don't have the monitor that you would have bought from Sony with it. This is the unit that was sold to uh, Sony service centers as the repair unit for beta movie cameras. And it should work with, uh, should work with the 110, the 220, the 550, and the 660. And what it is, is they call it a format converter, a signal converter. It's a BMCJ888U. I have two of these things now, but so here it is. And it actually allows you to take these connections here and connect them to certain places on the board. And it takes your audio and your control track, and things like that. And it actually connects into your, your heads with these connectors. And it allows you to actually uh, see what the beta movie sees. Since as many know, the beta movie doesn't have any kind of video output. So this creates a video output. And it also allows some basic functionality with eject and record. And there is a playback mode. Um, I don't believe it's color. If it is, it's not very stable. And uh, it gives you composite video out and some, some uh, oscilloscope connections and it gives you an RF output. But the thing is, since we all know, the beta movie does not run at the usual 15 kilohertz NTSC horizontal frequency. It actually outputs like something like 18 kilohertz <laughs> instead. So you'd have to get one of these and then modify a television set. Um, an old CRT to uh, to run at that frequency. And I'm working on that, but again, so many projects. And I've actually got a little circuit that I could probably convert it using, if I separate out the sync signals, I'm thinking I might be able to make an XY circuit and actually display it on the scope and avoid the modification of the TV. But uh, we'll see. But anyway, thanks for bearing with me. <laughs> um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this little lens guy here and I'm going to take it outside right now and plop it in some acetone and separate it and uh, give it a cleaning and I'll do a part two and that'll be the lens uh, as it continues and as we adhere it back together and put it back in the camera and test it out. So thanks for bearing with me. This has been another late night vintage electronics chat. See you later.